Hi everyone, my name is Tom Pettit and welcome to this episode of Beyond Come Follow Me. This week in your Come Follow Me lesson, you are reading and studying 2 Nephi chapters 11 through 19. I'm really excited about doing this video this week because 2 Nephi chapter 15 is one of my most favorite chapters in the entire Book of Mormon. Now it might be true that in each video I identify a chapter from that week's reading schedule as one of my favorites from the Book of Mormon. And it's true, but this one really is true as well. That 2 Nephi 15 is incredible. It's awesome because it's talking about the things that we see happening right before our eyes in the day in which we're living right now. And so it's super exciting and thrilling. And I'm anxious to spend a lot of time on 2 Nephi chapter 15. And then just a little briefly on the other chapters and, and whatnot. But all of this reading assignment, uh, Nephi is quoting from the great prophet Isaiah. And oftentimes, myself very included, we get intimidated by Isaiah or we just get through it. We just got to endure to the end and try to get to 2 Nephi chapter 26 when the Isaiah chapters are now behind us, or 25 rather. And, um, but yeah, and you know, there's nothing wrong with that. But as we slow down and take a look at what Isaiah is trying to teach us, we can learn an awful lot, a lot of things. I'm going to try to explain what I mean by that. But most importantly, and uh, at the top of that lengthy list of things we can learn is number one is we can learn more about our savior jesus christ and two we can learn more about his restored gospel for that is the very purpose in isaiah's writing what he wrote and the very purpose of nephi quoting isaiah is to teach us those two things so in chapter 11 nephi kind of sets us up as to why he's going to be quoting isaiah and so I'd like to go through chapter 11 a little bit, then jump to chapter 15, and we'll see where we go from that point. But in chapter 11, Nephi starts to teach us why Isaiah's words are so important. In fact, in that short chapter, he says five times the exact same phrase, that his soul delighteth in these words of Isaiah. Five times in that short chapter. And Nephi says that he is going to share Isaiah's teachings with us so that Isaiah's words can help prove that Nephi's and Jacob's words are true. So what are the words of Nephi that he's counting on Isaiah to testify and prove that his words are true? Well, we find that answer in 2 Nephi 25-26. When Nephi summarizes everything that he has been writing for the purpose of him writing and that is we talk of christ we rejoice in christ we preach of christ we prophesy of christ and we write according to our prophecies that our children may know to what source they may look for remission of their sins so in chapter 11 when nephi says i'm going to quote isaiah so that he can prove my words to be true his words are all focused on the Savior, Jesus Christ. So I encourage you that as you read through Isaiah, look for that. What is, what's Isaiah trying to teach me about the Savior in this phrase or this verse or this half chapter or full chapter? And if we start to just look for the Savior in the words of Isaiah, as opposed to deciphering all these symbolic stuff, then it starts to become more delightful as Nephi said it, or his soul is, is delighted by the words of, uh, of Isaiah. So a couple of things to keep in mind with Isaiah that might make Isaiah reading just a little bit easier. One, everything that Isaiah teaches points directly to Jesus Christ. He uses symbols to do that. Now, if we think back to when we concluded up the New Testament a few weeks ago, we finished with uh, John the Revelator in the Re book of Revelation. And John, he tries to describe what he's seeing. I see this and it kind of looks like this. And this is how I'm describing what I'm looking at. Isaiah, on the other hand, uses symbols, which is completely different. Just as hard to understand, but completely different. So when we look at it, instead of trying to decipher, hey, this means this, like we tried to do with John, it's more of a, hey, what does this mean? to me right now and how can this help me understand more about my relationship 
with Jesus Christ. Also in 2 Nephi 11, Nephi says twice, and Jacob says it at least once, and then Nephi is going to say it later again in his writing. So there's at least four times in which these Book of Mormon prophets are asking us to liken the words of Isaiah to ourselves. And when we think about how the Lord teaches, it is symbolically. When we go to the temple, everything that we learn and hear and see is symbol, sy symbolism of what the Lord's trying to teach us. And why is it that the Lord uses symbols like Isaiah does? It's so that we can, he can, it, it's one way that he teaches us or talks to us so that we can understand what we need to understand at that particular moment of our life. I was having this somewhat conversation or somewhat similar conversation with a former temple president. And we were talking about symbols and how the Lord teaches in symbols. And he says, you know, Tom, when, when a person goes to the temple and they learn from the Lord through symbols, they can learn what's most important for them at that moment. Because what, when the Lord uses a symbol, it may mean something to me, and it might mean something completely different to you. So who's right? We both are. And so as I go through 2 Nephi 15 here in a minute, I'm going to point out, hey, this is what, what I'm reading. This is what I'm hearing, and this is what I, I'm thinking as I'm reading these verses. You might come up with a different, not idea, but a different uh, perspective and say, you know what? I think it means this. So who's right? We both are. Because by using symbols, the way that you, what you hear and learn through the scriptures and what I hear and learn are probably going to be different. And so if they are different, if we come to different conclusions, that's a great thing to celebrate because that means that the Lord is speaking to both of us. So don't get caught up in trying to say, this symbol means this, and this symbol means that, and try to decipher it like you're Indiana Jones looking for a treasure or something. And be very careful about anybody who says that they've figured out Isaiah and they know what it all means, because that's not the way he teaches. And so look for the Savior, messages of his restored gospel and how they're applicable to you. And as you do that, I believe that you and I, as I try to do that as well, that we will be able to say, as Nephi says, that our soul delighteth in the words of Isaiah. All right, so let's go to chapter 15. Now, Isaiah here is setting the stage for something awesome that's coming at the end of chapter 15. And remember, I said this is one of my most favorite chapters because it is cool about what's, uh, what's happening here. Now, in the first part of chapter 15, I really think there's three sections. If we were going to kind of divide it up and here Isaiah is doing this and then this and he concludes with this, I kind of see three sec sections. The first section, he's comparing the house of Israel to a vineyard. And a vineyard is a place where they grow grapes with the intention of harvesting those grapes and pressing them into wine or juice and to uh, make use of it in, in a good and positive way, perhaps. And so he's comparing the house of Israel to this vineyard. And so he tell, starts to tell this story about how the Lord of the vineyard, or rather the owner of the vineyard, um, he, he prepares it for great success. He makes it as beautiful and as perfect as he can so that the uh, grapes will be able to thrive and they'll become everything that the owner of the vineyard wants it to be. So he fences it in, keep the animals and the weeds out and whatever else. He takes all the rocks out so that the soil is nice and fertile and gives an opportunity for these vines to take root and produce well. He puts a wine press in. So he says, hey, there's a purpose to all this. And it's an, a, a wonderful, great result. And so he puts the wine press in in preparation for that. He does everything necessary to have what we would deem a success um, uh, inside this vineyard. And then it starts. And the, uh, and the vines start to grow. And here come the grapes. And then the grapes kind of get out of control. And they turn wild, it says. And they turn into wild grapes. And they're good for nothing. They, they probably taste sour or they're, they don't have the right amount of juice or the, yeah, the flavor or something's wrong with them to where 
everything that the owner of this vineyard did was somewhat for naught because the entire harvest is is worthless. So he just has to get rid of it. So he kind of gets upset and he says, you know what? Take down the fence. We're just going to let the weeds go and, and we're just going to kind of set this aside for a little bit of time. Now, as we start to use this symbolically, what's really going on here? Isaiah tells us, luckily. And it's the Lord is the master of the vineyard. And he prepared a perfect plan for his children to grow and thrive in. And one day, symbolically making it to the wine press, the end result, one day to return to live with him. And so he set the plan and the stage that it's all perfect. But then what happens? The house of Israel rebels and they don't and they start to turn away from the Lord and they become wild grapes. Well, this hurts the Lord a lot. Now, at this point of the story, let's pause for a second and say, OK, what have we learned? And again, symbolically, what have you learned? What have I learned? Might be different, probably will be different. And that's totally OK. Because the way Isaiah is teaching is not an A for A, B for B type of work here. So first, it shows the great love that the Lord has for the house of Israel. He put together a perfect plan. He set the stage, a perfect stage, where the potential for the house of Israel to thrive is, is set. It's ready to roll. The Lord provided every opportunity for everybody to be successful in becoming what the Lord knows that they, meaning the house of Israel collectively, could become. But more importantly, he knows what each of us individually can become as well. But in return, of course, they rebel. So <clears throat> symbolically here, the Lord is allowing the house of Israel to reap what they have chosen. They've chosen to be wild to turn away from the Lord, to rebel against him. And the Lord respects, not, not positively respects, but respects in, in meaning that he's allowing them to choose whether or not to be obedient to the laws and commandments and ordinances of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And unfortunately, looking at it as a whole, not individually, but as a whole, the house of Israel decides to rebel and the Lord in his great sorrow uh, permits that to happen. So now they're rebelling. The people are going to be described in verse 8 through 25, not only how they're rebelling, rebelling against the Lord, but also the results that come into their lives because of their rebellion. So let's start here in verse 28. So we talk about the people and the results of their bad choices. And as I go through some of these, I'm just going to kind of bullet point. I'm not going to read every verse, of course. And as I bullet point through these, this description of the status of the house of Israel, I want you to think in your mind if you are seeing that today. So Isaiah was like 20, how long ago? A long time ago. It was nearly 2,500 years, 2,600 years ago. No, it was before J Jerusalem, before Lehi left Jerusalem. That was 600. So I, I don't know. Some biblical scholar is going to comment on the video and tell me. But So 3,000 years. We'll just say that. Isaiah is saying this 3,000 years ago. But see as I go through these bullet points of things that the house of Israel gets caught up in. See if you can recognize that as happening today. Like right now, today, before our very eyes. I think we can see all of these characteristics. So here are some of the attributes of a people and individuals who have turned their back on the Lord. Starting in verse 8, this describes the house of Israel collectively and individually uh, person, people uh, joining in the wicked ways of living. So we've got our choice. Here's, here's where we start going down the wrong path. We've got our choice of choosing the right or not. And here in verse 8, they're choosing not to. And not only are they choosing to turn their back against God, but they're choosing to join others who have made that similar or same choice. And then comes the desolation. And it's not so much that the Lord's punishing them, but that they're choosing uh, to, be, to put themselves in situations in which the Lord can't bless them because they're not being obedient to His laws. 
And in verse 10, we also see that as the Lord suffers or, or the land suffers to produce. And then in verse 11, the people start to pursue the worldly things, giving no thought to God or to the Lord or his righteous ways. In verse 12, I think that it's describing that people are worshiping false gods and there's no acknowledgement of him. Now let's pause for a moment. What is a false god? Is it uh, in, anciently they, they, think that there's a god over the rain and a god over the wind and the volcano went off because the god of volcanoes got upset. I don't think that it's the case in our world today. So what are those false gods that we worship? Well, it's anything that we put in, in line of importance above the Lord. And how can we determine if we're putting something above the Lord? How much time and devotion are you giving to each? Are you spending more time, money, attention, hope, desires, thought process, and everything else fixated on XYZ? And as a result, your relationship with the Savior suffers? Well, that's your ticket. That, that's your, your clue of what verse 12 is, worshiping a false god. It's not necessarily kneeling down and bowing to this thing in a person's life but it's where's your heart where have you turned to what brings you the most pleasure and happiness and joy and satisfaction and if that starts to outweigh the enjoyment and and uh, satisfaction that's found in the gospel of jesus christ well you probably got those scales mixed up a little bit and we're falling into that trap of verse 12 as Isaiah prophesied uh, the house of Israel would, would be doing. And then in verse 13, it says the, spiritual, the people are in captivity. And we're talking about spiritual captivity. They've turned their back against God. They've turned away from Him. And so they have fallen. We, sometimes we call this spiritual. We, they have fallen into spiritual death. Here, meaning the exact same thing, just a different word spiritual captivity and so now the people have fallen into spiritual captivity why because they don't have a knowledge of god now here's the difference between the nephites and lamanites let's take another lesson for today from the book of mormon what did the lamanites teach their children about god nothing the only thing that we have on record that the lamanites what during the time that they were wicked that they taught their children was to hate the nephites and why do we hate the Nephites? Because they believe in some unseen God. And they robbed our parents and stole from us and all those other false sorts. But they taught them, not only did they not teach them of God, but they taught them against God. Now, what did the Nephites do? I just quoted Nephi saying, we teach of Christ, we preach of Christ, so that our children may know the source of their salvation. And here Isaiah is saying, the world's acting like the Lamanites, and they're not teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so what happens just one or two generations later, they don't know about Jesus Christ. And so they're in a spiritual captivity, spirit prison, spirit death, because they don't have a knowledge of anything else. They don't know. This is all building towards something pretty awesome. Okay, it's coming. The awesome part is coming. What we're reading now is not so awesome, but it's reality. In verse 14, apostasy is spreading or has spread throughout the entire world. Now, apostasy, we, we nearly always define it as uh, a, a choice. I'm, I'm choosing to become an apostate and rebel against God. Well, somebody had to make that decision and, and start that choice for that cascade of spiritual captivity to come to fruition over time. And so call it what you want, but throughout the world has become a lack of knowledge of the true gospel of Jesus Christ. And then in verse 18, I would do want to read this one. Woe unto them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity and sin as it were with a cart rope. Now, here's one of those very unique times where Isaiah is actually describing what's going on and not so much using some symbolism. But we got to say, okay, he's, he's talking in some ancient language here. 
what what is this meaning woe unto them or we feel really sorry for the situation of these people and the people are described as drawing iniquity with cords of vanity and sin as it were with a cart rope or a rope that pulls a cart and so he's describing now back to sin now that we're using physical tangible ideas in our minds he's now symbolically saying house of israel you have fallen into sin into habits into um into uh, uh yeah in, into habits uh that are so binding and so hard and so gripping it's as though you are a cart and somebody is pulling you with a with a rope and you can't get away that's um what is the word i'm looking for um addictions that's the word i'm looking for that's that's a description of an addiction being tied up and dragged by this rope or tied up and dragged by this addiction and so woe unto the people man we feel sorry for those people that are under such addictive sins that they feel as though they cannot get out of it do we see that today holy cow we see that all the time before technology took off we'd say well that's word of wisdom stuff but now with technology it's Word of wisdom stuff and every type of morality issue you can think of is all of these addictions and so many other addictions. An addiction can be a, a negative addiction, can be just simply wasting time or refusing to do what's right. And so there's a lot of things that uh, that that can describe our very day with as well. Okay, then we get down to 19. Here it's summarizing people judging God and telling him what to do, making a mock of sacred things. Or I'm going to live, I, I feel that I can live this way, even if it's in opposition to the commandments of God. Or I don't need to go to church, I just have to be a good person. Yeah, you have to be a good person. We appreciate you, you know, driving without anger and th saying thank you. And, you know, being a nice person is wonderful. We like that. But being a nice person isn't going to make you a recipient. or of the full blessings of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so sometimes here, as Isaiah is, show, is uh, indicating, as we see in the world, is people are saying, hey, I know better than God, and this way, my way, is better than that old-fashioned, churchy way. And it just doesn't work. And then we get into verse 20. Let me read part of this, or I'll read the whole thing. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. We think about the world today, this is obvious. This is the most obvious verse of, the, of all of them, that call evil good and good evil. And it goes back to a, what I was saying um, uh, in regards to verse 19. Um, where we say, hey, that's that might be what the Lord says, but today is today, and, and these things that used to be bad and negative and taboo, that's actually good stuff. And and it's ta they've taken it a step further. It's not only, hey, this is okay and acceptable, but it's if you're in opposition to this, now you're the bad guy. So yeah, we're going to call evil good, and if you try to correct us, you're the monster. You're the one that needs to be silenced. And so it's as though they've taken what Isaiah is prophesying that's going to be happening, and they've multiplied it ten times over, even more so than Isaiah is describing here. And then we get to 21. This describes putting earthly knowledge above faith. Hey, faith is something, you know, I'll get to when I get to. I've got to know. I've got to see. I've got to feel. I've got to touch. I've got to recognize and put it into an, an equation that I can prove. And that's certainly a trap that can slip us down into what Isaiah described there as spiritual captivity as well, when we let go of our faith because we need evidence. I love what Elder or President Oaks said. He said, if faith wasn't, re he said, no, he said, if, if we knew the answer to everything, faith wouldn't be required, but faith is required. And so we're not going to know the answer to everything in this life.
23, they're glorifying the, the riotous living, uh, the wicked living. So we see these celebrities and these people that we think are important and that we, we, we'd like and want to maybe even be like, and they go out and they do things that are contrary to what our Heavenly Father would want us to do. And what do we do? We glorify them for it. We tell them how awesome they are. We, we buy tickets and whatever else, shirts and time and download their stuff and, and, uh, and we, we, we reward them. For living a life contrary to the commandments of the Lord. So all these things are happening and so much more. And what's the Lord's reaction to the rebellion within the house of Israel? Therefore is the anger of the Lord kindled against his people, and he hath stretched forth his hand against them, and hath smitten them, and the hills do tr did tremble, and their car carcasses did tremble, and and uh, in uh, or their carcasses were torn in the midst of the street. For all of this, his anger is not turned away. So his anger is not turned away. He's dissatisfied with what's going on because of the rebellion. But his hand is stretched out still, despite what's gone on from verse eight through twenty-four the Lord is still having his face towards the house of Israel, his hands extended, and he beckoning them, even begging them to come unto him, to repent, be cleansed, and enjoy the blessings of the restored gospel. So how's he going to fix it? How's he going to turn around verses 8 through 24 and invite the house of Israel to return to him and receive of those blessings. President Nelson gave us a clue in a recent general conference talk. He said, there has never been a time in the history of the world when knowledge of our savior is more personally vital and relevant to every human soul. So how is the Lord going to fix this rampant, scene of unrighteous living. He is going to take to them the gospel of Jesus Christ. There has never in the time of the history of this world when knowledge of our Savior is more personally vital and relevant to every human soul, says President Nelson. And that is how the Lord is going to fix and is fixing a broken world. He's going to send the message of Jesus Christ to all of the house of Israel, and he's going to start gathering them. So this is where it gets super exciting. Verse 26, how's he going to do it? We know what he needs to do. He and President Nelson said, we got to send the message of a Savior and the message of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ to the world. In verse 26, and the Lord, this is how he's going to do it. He will lift up an ensign to the nations. What's an ensign? The church uh, website says this. It defines it in this way. In the last days, the Lord will gather scattered Israel. He has begun this work by restoring his authority in his church, as well as by sending his servants to preach the gospel. They invite people to gather by accepting Jesus Christ, obeying him, making covenants and assembling in stakes of Zion in their own lands. The Book of Mormon and the Church of Jesus Christ are symbolic ensigns to all nations of the earth. Also included in the work of gathering are ordinances performed for deceased ancestors. Let's not forget them. So what is this ensign? He will lift up an ensign to the nation. The ensign is two things. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and the Book of Mormon. It's these two things that will fix a fallen, unrighteous world. Continues on. He will lift up an ensign to the nations from far, and he will hiss unto them from the ends of the earth. What in the world does that mean? Hiss. Well, let's cross-reference it. The footnotes there. It's 2 Nephi chapter 29, verse 2. And also, 
that this Nephi speaking, and also that I may remember the promises which I have made, or excuse me, this is Nephi quoting the Lord. And also that I may remember the promises which I have made unto thee, Nephi, and also unto thy father, that I would remember your seed, and that the words of your seed should proceed forth out of the mouth of your unto your seed, and my words shall hiss forth unto the ends of the earth, for a standard unto my people, which are of the house of Israel. So here the Lord is using the word hiss again. So when we read in 2 Nephi 15 that the church and the Book of Mormon will be established and that he will hiss unto them, meaning the house of Israel, what's he doing when he hisses? 2 Nephi 29.9. He says, Nephi, I will take your words and the words of your seed and send them to the house of Israel. Where do we find the words of Nephi? And the words of his posterity. It's the Book of Mormon. So let's go back now. We're going to be taking word for word and kind of flip-flopping back. Here's what Isaiah says. Here's what we understand. So be patient because this is great. And he will lift up an ensign. He'll establish a church and produce the Book of Mormon, and it will hiss unto them. He will send the Book of Mormon throughout the world and use the Book of Mormon to invite them to this other enzyme. He'll also use the first enzyme, the Book of Mormon, to invite them to come and join the second enzyme, that being the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So he will hiss unto them. Who is the them? Those that receive the Book of Mormon. And then we continue on. Uh, and behold, they shall come with speed, swiftly. Who's they? Members of the house of Israel who receive or get in their hands and read the Book of Mormon. Why is Isaiah describing them as coming swiftly? And where are they going to? They're coming by being gathered, just as that quote said as I read to you, they're being gathered via the Book of Mormon to the church, and it's happening fast. You've heard in conference over and over and over again the prophets and apostles saying that the Lord is hastening his work. The word hasten, speed, swiftly. They all mean the same thing. And so he is, is moving his work forward quickly. But it's not just that the message is getting out quickly. It's that it's being accepted and responded to quickly as well. I heard two days ago in state conference, a general authority say that on, on average throughout the world, on, on the average weekend throughout the world, there are 25,000 convert baptisms. It's crazy. It's going fast. And what's most remarkable is how quickly they're accepting the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're not putting in years of study like Brigham Young did. They're reading some of the Book of Mormon. They're praying about it, finding out that it's true, and they're accepting and wanting to join because they want more of what they know to be true and right. And so it's, it's going out fast, but they're being gathered fast as well. Let's take the next line. None shall be weary nor stumble among them. Okay, who is he talking about here? Those taking the Book of Mormon message and the, uh, that of the restoration to the world. So the people who are delivering the message or gathering Israel, they are described as not slumbering or being weary. Now let's take a look at this. The, the spreading of the gospel of Jesus Christ has no time to sleep. Not only because of the urgency, but because of the reality. We have missionaries now scattered throughout the entire world. In my ward alone, we have missionaries that are on every single continent, with the exception of Antarctica. And among all those missionaries, just from my ward, who are on every continent throughout the world, collectively they represent eight spoken languages. And so as they are throughout the world, as, as the, our missionary in Africa goes to sleep, who's waking up? Our ward missionary over in um, the Philippines. And so it's continual all the time, round the clock, it's happening, and they're not sleeping. The message goes forth. 
we there's never down time. Even when COVID came and wrecked havoc throughout the world, the gospel of Jesus Christ didn't sleep. We didn't say, okay, let's wait till this thing is over and then we'll rev up this missionary work thing again. Not even COVID put the missionary work to sleep. And then we get down and we, dis and we get a description of these gatherers throughout the next several verses. So who are the gatherers? Our missionary force throughout the world. So none shall slumber nor sleep. We just talked about that. Neither shall the girdle of their loins be loosed. This has reference to an ancient um, wardrobe uh, it, it, style. So anciently, in Isaiah's time and place, uh, the men would wear these robes, you know, keep it cool or whatever. And that's just the style. It's just the way it was. But when it's time to fight, when it's time to go to battle, what they do is they, is they gather up the loose clothing from their, their ankles up and they start bringing it in. And then they, they hoist it around one leg and then bring it around their, all that cloth around their waist like a belt. And so now when they're, they go from a free flowing gown to now being ready for war, because now their legs are free and able to move. You can run, you can kick, you can jump, you know, whatever you needed to do. Whereas before that long robe was, would be cumbersome in trying to do those activities. And so that's what gird up your loins means. It means, hey, it's time to get to work. We're going to put our work clothes on and we're going to go out and take care of the task that is needed. And so what have our, what have our missionaries done? They are girding up their loins and getting to work. Neither shall the girdle of their loins be loosed. So it's not going to be that way. So what is it going to be? They're girding them up. So you think of the, um, the song, uh, Come, Come, You Saints. Gird up your loins, fresh courage take because it's time to get to work. All right. Also, that can be very descriptive of always being ready. When you've when you're, uh, got your guard down, or your gird down in this case, if that's the way you say it, and you've got that free-flowing robe on, you can't be ready to go in a moment's notice. But if you've girded up those loins, man, now you're ready to act. There's no, the time of preparation is girding your loins. And now you're, you're ready. You're ready to roll. And so uh, the next description here is the latchet of their shoes um, shall not, or, or sh uh, let's see, uh, nor the latchet of their shoes be broken. So again, that means that the latchets of their shoes are not broken. Again, they're prepared. They've got the right shoes on. They can now go. I'm talking symbolically here. They've got the right shoes on to move forward and do the work. So by girding up your loins and getting the shoes on, it's symbolic of being prepared to go and gather Israel. Isaiah is saying you just can't walk out and go gather. It doesn't happen that way. You've got the enzymes, the church and the Book of Mormon. You've got a people ready and willing and anxious to accept it. Now you've got this gathering force that is prepared. They're girded, their shoes are ready to go. And how have they become prepared? This army of gatherers, the Book of Mormon, and a little thing called Preach My Gospel. By knowing and understanding those two resources, our missionary forces are completely, more than adequately prepared to go and gather Israel. But having the books is not sufficient. In verse 28, describing the gatherers whose arrows shall be sharp and all their bows bent. This army is going forth to spread the gospel with their arrows. Why is Isaiah using an arrow to describe our missionary force? Because in battle, your most important weapon is your arrow. That's how you win the battle. So what's the missionary force's arrow? Their testimonies, the spirit that they carry with them. 
the opportunity to use those arrows in gathering Israel. So they've got the tools. They're armed with the Book of Mormon and preach my gospel. But now they've got sharp arrows. Testimonies. Faith. The Spirit. And now combining it all, they're going out to gather and win this battle as it's being symbolically described. And their horses' hoofs shall be counted like flint and their wills like a whirlwind. They're roaring like a lion. So those first two phrases of moving swiftly, they're out there preaching every single day. Is it any wonder why we give our missionaries no distractions? You are focused 100% solely on the work. And so that's an opportunity to move it forward without distractions or interference from anything else in their personal lives. That's what I believe the horse's hoofs and the, and, um, and the wills like whirlwind refer to these, this missionary force moving forward without distraction to get the job done. And then they are described as roaring like a lion. The lion, when they roar, People take notice. The other animals take notice. There's no hesitation in knowing and claiming that's a lion. I understand that noise. I hear that noise and I know exactly where that's coming from. A lion. And when you're at the zoo and you're walking down the path and you hear the roar of a lion, even when you can't see the lion, you take notice. It catches your attention. And the message that the missionaries are bringing are catching the attention of Israel. They're recognizing it. In fact, I heard, not of a quote, but I heard Elder Holland say, as I was sitting right next, near him, that the missionary department has tracks so much so that our missionaries are just absolutely perfectly prepared. They know exactly what works. And one of those things that the missionary department had tracked it for many, many years, surveying hundreds of thousands maybe of converts to the church, is that 50% of those who join the church know that the message is true when they first see the missionaries. Not after they have the first lesson or after they come to church or after they're fellowshiped by members of the ward. Although all those things are necessary, 50% said, I knew the message was true when I saw the missionaries. Just saw them, even before I heard their testimonies. So the message, the missionaries, people take notice. Like the roar of a lion, they see, they recognize. They pay attention. And then we get to verse 29. And it's like Isaiah says, yes, they roar like a lion, but I see in vision this mighty army of missionaries. And he describes them further. And they, they shall roar like young lions. Because that's who they are. An army of gatherers who are young. It makes me think of this song. As Zion's youth in latter days, we stand with valiant heart. With promise shining in our eyes, resolve to do our part. Upon a noble past we build, the future fills our view. We face the challenge of our day and pledge we will be true. And also this one, hope of Israel, Zion's army, children of the promised day. See the chieftain signal onward and the battles in array. Does this not describe Second uh, Nephi 15, 26 through 30? See the foe in countless numbers marshaled in the ranks of sin. Hope of Israel on to battle, now the victory must we must win. Strike for Zion down with error. Flash the sword above the foe or the arrows, as Isaiah describes it. Every stroke disarms a foreman. Every step we conquering go. 
Soon the battle will be over, every foe of truth be down. Onward, onward, youth of Zion, thy reward the victor's crown. Hope of Israel, rise in might, with the sword of truth and right. Sound the war cry, watch and pray, vanquish every foe today. One more symbolism or symbol that I'd like to do here in verse 29. And they shall roar like young lions, which I've talked about. They shall roar and lay hold of the prey. They are going to go out and they are going to dismantle a wicked world, tear it apart and put it down just as the songs say they will. And lay hold of the prey and shall carry away safe. Who? Those members of the house of Israel that willingly choose to be gathered. And how are they gathered? Not literally to a physical location, but they are gathered safely home to the safe confines of the gospel of Jesus Christ. These young lions, having been prepared and ready to go gather, will find them and bring them in safely. They shall carry away safe, and they will be the ones that deliver. That's 2 Nephi chapter 11 through 19, but really just a lot of focus just on exclusively 15 there. But remember that the symbols throughout all these Isaiah chapters, they do two things, point to Jesus Christ and invite us to come closer to him by obeying the laws and gospel principles, covenants and ordinances that are found in the church of Jesus Christ. So as you study the words of Isaiah, make sure to liken them to yourself and to try to hear what the Lord is trying to teach you through these words. This I say in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.